What's going on everybody? It's Matt Faircloth. Thank you for watching this Facebook and YouTube feed. I'm Matt and I've got some awesome guests for you guys today. This is Andrew Cushman. Give it up. Hey, cool. And you. I've got the one, the only, Mr. David Green right here who is joining us. And we're here at a conference in Texas, in Austin, Texas. And we want to do a live. Turn your volume off, man. Come on. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm hearing myself from somewhere. What is that? Anyway, cool. So while we're uh, while we're getting warmed up here, I want you guys to do a few things. I want you guys to take a minute, if you guys are watching this, and give this a like. Because what that does is it tells the social media media channel that's watching this, that's broadcasting this, it says, hey, social media people, I like this. And it sends that the fact that you like it out to the social media folks, and they're going to show it to more people. So YouTube and Facebook will propagate the bigger pockets message and show more bigger pockets cool stuff like this to more people. And that's what we want to do. We want to get the we want to get the word out about cool stuff that bigger pockets is up to. So take a minute, everybody, and like this, okay? And uh, also come up with some questions because we are here for you guys to. Ask whatever you guys want, and we're gonna just have a, like a half an hour chat about whatever you guys want to get want to get into at this time, okay? And so get your questions ready. But while you're thinking of your question, give us give us everybody a like, okay? Now intros. You guys all know this guy. This is the man right here. It's, I, I love your interviews on the podcast. I really do. I love your just your demeanor, your tone, the way you show up on that podcast is awesome, and I love what you do for it. But to, but for those of you guys that have been living in a cave, and you don't know who this is. And let's introduce to the people that have been living in a cave. Tell them who you are. So I'm David Green. This yeah. is my, my hype man, Matt Faircloth. <laughs> I'm, I'm hiring to bring him around everywhere I go. Because as long as I get introduced like that, I'm just going to bat a thousand at anything that That's I do. Terrible. That was awesome. I, I co-host the Bigger Pockets podcast with Brandon Turner. I'm a single family uh, real estate investor. I also do multifamily deals in and mostly other people's syndications at this point. I wrote the book on long distance real estate investing as well as the book Buy, Rehab, Rent, Refinance, Repeat. That book's actually doing really well. So any of you guys that bought it, thank you very much. We are currently the top real estate book on all of Amazon right now. And I am right in between Rich Dad, Poor Dad and the 4-Hour Work Week, two, two very big uh, bestsellers. He's coming for you, Kiyosaki. That's exactly yeah. right, man. Be careful. <laughs> you bye. better have your guns and ammo ready. Right, right. Yeah, and he does. He does. He does. He does. He does. He does. That's what... I'm Matt Fairclough. I'm, I'm I'm a guy that talks a lot with cameras on me uh, for uh, for Bigger Pockets and my YouTube channel. Um, Full time investor, been doing it for 15 years straight, and I love talking about real estate with people that are willing to listen to me. Yourself, oh, that's it. That's it. All right, you. The, the, look at all these. Look at all the thumbs up. Look at yeah, all the love you're getting. Well, oh, it's because of you. It's not. Yeah, I think you, it's it's because they they're anticipating you about to talk is what they're doing. All right. They're all like, let's hear from Cushman. The guys sitting in the shadows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm Andrew Cushman. I'm the guy uh, who uh, was so bad at prospecting that I went, when I went into real estate, it took me uh, over 4,500 phone calls to get my first deal. Uh, and then uh, did that full time for four and a half years and said, this is great, but it's a job. It's not going to last forever. What's going to be the next big thing? Uh, 2011 went out and uh, bought a 92 unit apartment complex syndicated that and I uh, said you know what this is the next big thing it's scalable it provides passive income I can serve a lot of other people in the process of doing it and since then done about uh, 1800 units and do apartments full-time uh, mostly in the southeast US cool that's awesome that's awesome I've learned a lot from this man um, I call him my mentor. I don't even know how he feels about that, but I call it to him whether he I'll likes it. I'll take that. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. That's up. So we've got the social media feeds are blowing up. We got YouTube lighting up here. I know you got some Facebook questions. Anybody from Facebook? You want to? You want to give anybody from Facebook a shout out or any uh, question that somebody's got that you want to get the convo started with? Well, we got single family. Uh, Jerry Perron. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Uh, single family rentals versus multifamily. Hmm. Okay, I have an opinion about that briefly. There is no better rental, cash on cash, that you're going to get than a single family home that is that is rented with good tenants that, pay, that take care of the property and pay their rent on time. But eventually those single fam family home tenants will move out and you're gonna pay big money to renovate that, that uh, single family home. So I think that for longevity and for long-term stability, an apartment building is a better investment than a multifamily building. And I'm just throwing it out there just to get an opinion going. What do you think? Pick one. All right, so here's what you gotta understand. They both have their own purposes. Mm -hmm. A single family mm -hmm. residential property 
is not intended to be a business. It is not intended to be an investment. Now, it can be, quote unquote, Jimmy Rig to work that way. You can buy a single family house and rent it out for more than what it costs to own it, giving you a return. That is possible. A multifamily property is designed for the purpose of creating cash flow and making money. That's the purpose yep. that it serves, right? Mm -hmm. So it's valued completely differently. Appraisers look at a multifamily property from the perspective of this is a business and we are going to value it as how profitable this business is. That's why we have metrics like NOI. That doesn't go into how a single family property is valued. And that's specifically because appraisers don't look at single family properties the same way because the vast majority of them are not bought by investors. They are not run by businesses. They're bought by people that want to live in it. So that's the first thing you have to understand. You can make money in single family real estate. It's probably going to be easier in the end to create equity through it than it is just cash flow because like Matt said, people move out, things get broken. Your, your expenses are much higher because you don't have economies of scale like you do with an apartment, but you can make money with it. Now that money is much less, is much less efficient than a multifamily property. Multifamily properties are incredibly efficient because they were designed to work in that way, mm -hmm. right? Imagine like a Ferrari that comes out of the dealership designed to be a high performance vehicle. That's multifamily from a cash flow perspective. Now you can still soup up a Dodge Charger, put an incredibly strong engine in it, you can make it go really fast, but pieces are gonna break. You're gonna have to move things around. You're gonna have to add spoilers and different tires. And to make it work the way you want it to work, there's more work involved. Mm. So that's why people tend to start with single family because it's easier to get off the ground, but then once you get to be a certain size, it's really hard to keep that car performing like the stuff that was designed to work that way. So when you're asking single family or multifamily, you gotta ask yourself the question, where am I right now and how much work am I willing to put in? If you know I wanna start at a fast speed, I'm willing to save up the money to buy the Ferrari and I don't wanna to have to put my car together, boom, that's the way you go. If you say, you know what, I wanna get on that track as soon as possible and learn how to race, man, buy yourself a Honda Civic, put a souped up engine in it, learn how to drive it around and when you get tired of taking it into the shop all the time, maybe trade it in, use it for the down payment on the Ferrari. That's the advice that I would give. If you guys love the car analogy for real estate analysis, that's fantastic. Give give us a give a heart on Facebook in that because I love that. I've never heard that analogy before. I that's just incredible. made that up right now. That's, isn't that great? Analogy, just yeah, like yeah. dropping dropping knowledge bombs like that, just making it up. <laughs> like, hey, look at this. Cool. Do you? Uh, nah, I know you're gonna tell us single family is the best, right? Well, First. yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know how to add on to what these two say. For what now. he said. Wow, what, yeah. what, what, what We've he got said. a ton of questions, so you well, say, uh, real give quick, us a, give real, us a, real quick, yeah. I would say. What, the one that's better is the one that's going to get you started, right? Yep. Can you do a multifamily first, four unit, five unit, ten unit? Or are you are you ready to just go do that? Or if not, if you'll start by buying a single family, then go do that. I have a neighbor who retired with like six million in equity and all the cash flow he needed because every time he bought a house, he moved and kept it. That's all he did. But you can go into multifamily to scale, and just like David said, those are designed for cash flow and to be efficient. Whereas if you get a whole bunch of houses and roofs scattered all over, that can be inefficient. Um, so for scaling and, and, and going big, definitely multifamily, but for getting started, whichever one you can do first. Got a question from uh, Dylan. Cool, Dylan, great question from YouTube, thank you. Um, I have a question. How do I pull li such lists as probate, divorce, and whatnot from my county? Do I simply go to the courthouse and tell them what list I want and then they'll put it together for me? Likely not that easy. There, there are list assemblage websites. List Source is one of them. Um, Foreclosure.com is another one. And there's actually, if you have a Bigger Pockets Pro membership, you can get a discount through the Pro Perk uh, section at Foreclosure.com. And there's a ton of other Pro Perks that, uh, that you can get on things like Property Scout and other things that will help you find deals. Um, but probate, that is a, the, the probate function is through the courts. Um, probates where it's you know pretty much what happens when somebody dies and how their estate gets dissolved goes to the probate courts. So if you want to go to probate list, um, my advice to you is to talk to an estate attorney because the estate attorney really is who's driving the bus um, on a probate matter. And so I would start with that legal action. Um, let's jump, let's grab another question. What do you got? Well, I, I I do want to stop and say that that Megan wants to compliment your shirt. Really likes your shirt. That's why he's in the middle. He's the captain. I know. Yeah, and I, I'm a big Captain America fan. For those of you guys who watch my YouTube channel, I have a big Captain America doll that stands behind me and stuff like that. So I want to ask you guys in the comments 
write in there if we were all an Avenger, which one we would be and why. Oh, <laughs> oh great. Well, they know who I'm going to be because I'm wearing the shirt. Okay, but that's I want to know. Point. I, I, who would I, I be? Who I really I want to write it down on a piece of paper which one they think you're going to be, and I, I can't. I, I have no idea. Who oh, I know exactly be. who he should. Yeah, be. I just you? don't want to ruin it. Yeah, but, but I can't. Oh, we can't say. So if we were all Avengers, don't say Black Widow. Which one would be? <laughs> no, right? <it's> not Black <laughs> it's, I, yeah, You'll know right. what I say. He'd be like, oh, of course, that's what he said. Oh, I, I got it too. I got it in my head. All right, so I know. I know my my guess is only you guys going to see. So if we were an Avenger, which one would be? Great question. Uh, you get a question. You want to give a shout? You want to get a question? Or? Yeah, I saw one. Um, and that's, uh, let's see. Give a uh, shout out. Yeah, Hayward. Sa- Hayward yeah. Lovett says I'm running into a recurring issue trying to get trying to get together funding from investors because I don't have any experience. What would you recommend I do to overcome this hurdle? We Find someone it. who does have experience and partner with them. That's not, not, it's the quickest um, way to overcome that hurdle. And it's another way to help make sure that your lack of um, experience doesn't cause a mistake that's going to cost you investors down the road by putting a pot mark on your track record. Cool. That's great. And I think that I agree. Just join a team. Find someone who's doing what you're doing and see if they can mentor you and teach you how to do what they do. So, yeah. so the three of us, we're all actually in Austin, Texas right now for a Go Abundance event. It's this group we belong to. And I think I used a car analogy because we just got done racing cars <laughs> around a, a track. I was that helps. Actually, that helps. And, and what... The reason I'm bringing this up is because we all hang out as a group. We have fun together, but we also talk business. And what happens is just like the Avengers, we bring different aspects (laughs) of strength into the team so we can accomplish things more. So Andrew and I work on deals together a lot because we are like the perfect complement for what we do. Andrew looks at things from a perspective. He's very detailed. He knows exactly how to make something happen. I look at things from a perspective of how can I be more efficient and make it faster. You don't want to drive a car too fast without being able to keep it on the road because you'll crash. You don't want to keep a car on the road perfectly but not driving it fast because you won't get anywhere. If you get two people together that can each bring a part of that, you have a better partnership. So like Matt was saying, or like Andrew was saying, when you form a partnership, you want to look for someone whose stuff compliments you and that you like. You don't want to be a partner with someone that you can't stand talking to and you're bickering and fighting all the time and it kind of turns you off from real estate. That's why we're in a group like this. But you guys don't have to be in GoBundance. You could all form your own group, your own mastermind. You could join a local meetup and find people and, and find the person you vibe with that also has good skills, work together. So that's just a side note for you guys is learn from stuff like the Avengers. Now, we didn't plan on talking about that, but I think that's perfect. Mm-hmm. Matt, just like Captain America, brought Andrew and I together, right? Assembled this team. Avengers assemble. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah, right. <laughs> there you go. So, the question I'll answer is about uh, how do you get around a bad appraiser who lowball the yeah. property value even though there are half dozen comps to support the price? And it might have been Nathan, but it could have been someone else that said, basically, how do you fire an appraiser? Yeah. The thing you got to understand about appraisers is they're not there to serve you, they are there to serve the lender. Yeah. Yeah. The lender is Good going point. to be the person that chooses them. Not you. Now, you can hire an appraiser, of course, if you want to pay money, but that's not who they're going to use. The bank's going to use on the refi. So there's not much. You can't fire them, first of all. There's not much you can do to make them see it from your perspective. You're much better off, rather than trying to get them to see it from your perspective, to learn to see it theirs. Maybe you got six great comps to support your case, but there's 12 comps that the appraiser would say, well, I'm going to look at these. Don't get caught when you're buying a property. This usually comes up in the burr because you're trying to refinance it. Don't get caught up by letting your excitement dictate how you filter information. When you see this deal could be great and you so badly want to buy a house and you start looking for comps to subconsciously support your belief that it's a great deal. We call that confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. You're looking for everything that says this is a great deal and you're actually ignoring the 12 that the appraiser is looking at that says this is not a great deal. That's real. That's one of the things I can say to people because they'll come to me and say, David, look, here's a comp. He's not using it. And then I'll talk to the appraiser and he'll have like 14 other comps that are much, much lower. And you didn't use the one that you wanted. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly yeah. the case. But use the other 14 that, right. right. Yes. They're, that, that's a great point. They're not there to work for you. They're there to work for the bank. Yes. And people forget that. Um, even though you're paying them, they're there to work for the yeah. bank. Right. Um, okay, Andrew, what do you got question wise? And how are we doing with this Avengers thing? I can't wait to hear. Do they think, do they think that you're Thanos or not? I haven't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm right. the skinniest guy here. Right, I know, that's I true. Like Thanos. That's true. You could be Groot. <laughs> yeah, right. Maybe that's who they think he is. That's right. All right. All right. Hayward says uh, that he now that he thinks about it, we are moving up on the list of his favorite Avengers. So that's All right. right. That's All right. Good, good, good. Um, oh, just lost the feed. So what do you got over okay. there? Um. I don't know. We're we're still going. Are you? Did you yeah, I got it. I got it back. I got it. Okay, back. good. Oh, you lost your you lost your second. But we're back. 
Um, okay, so I'd love to hear what people say about this Avenger stuff. I get so many of these questions for people that come to us, and you probably do too, for people that are young, right? And if you're young, that's okay, first of all, um, that people that are 18, 19, 20 years old that want to get involved in the real estate investing world. And so it's like, well, I'm 19, what do I do? And so this is someone who's 19, also lives in a very expensive part of Canada. Um, I know a guy that wrote a book on long distance investing, long distance investing. So you speak to that. I'll speak to the 19 year old part of that oh, question. Um, so if you're 19, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. And it doesn't mean you've got to go out and get a job and do something that sucks for the first 10 years until you turn 29 and have this life epiphany like a lot of us do in our, in our late 20s, early 30s and get into real estate debt. You can do this now, but you might have to. You might want to consider interning under a larger organization to learn some of the ropes. If you're not going to go to college, that's okay too, but just you got to get some exposure to the work somehow. Maybe don't go and try and buy a 100 unit apartment building by the time that you're 20. Maybe try and work for a larger outfit um, it, it, understand this is just part of your education and, and design like a little curriculum for yourself to get educated over like a two to three year period once you graduate your quote from that then you can go start investing on your own but there's a lot to learn about this business and consider doing that and I commend you for being 19 and wanting to get wanting to get into real estate yeah it's awesome what do you want to say about remote investing from Canada if you're trying to force Canadian real estate to work from a cash flow perspective and you're finding that it's not if you get too frustrated you'll quit and even if you don't quit, you just keep hammering your head into a brick wall. That doesn't ever actually knock down the brick wall. It just makes gives you a headache. In those circumstances, you should learn how to invest long distance. You should go to the market that makes sense for what you're trying to do and learn how to do it there. Now, if the Canadian market worked well, there's no reason to invest long distance. It's fine. Invest, invest where you're at. But what you have to do is protect the part of you that really wants to do this. You, you have to protect your own motivation, your ambition, the desire you have to build wealth because if the experience is too bad, you will be traumatized and you'll completely shut it down. We've all seen this from people that have been in a, in a relationship with someone right off the bat, one of their first ones that went badly, and then they never want to date again or they're bitter, they're jaded about everybody else. That's what happens if you cling to something too hard and try to make it work when it's not working. I don't know anyone that's doing buy and hold cash flow almost anywhere in Canada. Just the economics of that country does not make sense. They're all coming to America. So that's probably what I would do too. But I would still be preparing for when the Canadian economy changes and there's a lot of opportunity. Like, like Matt was saying, what if you go intern for a company, you learn how this works, you're building up your knowledge, you're saving your capital, and then when the market changes, you are poised to strike when yeah. everyone else is scrambling yeah. trying to find their stuff to get ready. And if they were to do long distance in investing, is what like a resource or book should they check out about they if only someone this. had written one of them. Yeah. But wait, I believe they did. So what? Yeah, I wrote long distance real estate investing, how to buy, <laughs> rehab, and manage out of state and rental property. And if you're saying, well, I'd love to do that, but I don't have any money, Matt here wrote a book you called know? Raising Private Capital. And it's funny you mentioned that because today. <laughs> Actually, tomorrow is the one-year anniversary of the release date of my book, awesome, August thirteenth. August thirteenth, one year ago. Thank you. We'll put a little cake on it, a little, yeah. little candle on it, right? Um, for my birthday. And so, if you guys want to have not read my book, Raising Private Capital, Bigger Pockets has created a coupon code for you guys to check out my book, Raising Private Capital. You got to go to biggerpockets.com forward slash store biggerpockets.com forward slash store. You can buy the book, Raising Private Capital, by using the coupon code book birthday book birthday will get you 20% off of the book. You gotta buy it today, and that'll get you 20% off of the book as a celebration of the book being one year old, which is really awesome. I still have to pitch myself that I'm a published author and it's been an entire year since that book's been out. Um, but you guys have an opportunity to go check it out. So, Beautiful. Um, nice. You got a question? What do you got? Yeah, so Ethan Atkinson wants to know, what's the best advice when you have lots of good experience as a manager, rehab, or agent, but not in big 30, 50, 150 unit properties. Should I go find deals for y'all? So we weren't listening. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's right. So you want to work for us looking for deals for our businesses? Is that wait, what? Wait, wait, wait. I would actually, I would, I would, I would look at it the other way, um, Ethan, and actually your, your skill set is gonna benefit somebody who already has the deals, right? So let's say I find a big deal in Atlanta and you come to me and say, look, I can help do the renovation, I can help with management, I can do rehab coordination, all of this stuff. I might be interested, say, okay, cool. Um, you can take some of this off my plate. So it's not, I mean, from what you said here, your skill set or what you're currently doing isn't going out and finding the big deals, it's kind of everything else. So your best partner is probably gonna be somebody who has the deals 
you go partner with them, offer those services, offer that contribution to their business, and then you can take it from there. Either a great partnership forms, or you learn something, then you go find deals, and now you have the whole complete, you know, every piece of the puzzle, you can do your own thing. Um, so I would go look for somebody who already has the deal finding and partner up with them. Yeah, that's great. Good stuff. Um, go ahead, David. It's got a great question from Jerome. Wholesaling or Burr? Which do you prefer for getting started? Researching both. I don't want to try too many things at once. I would prefer to become an expert at one and then add the other later. Jerome, I'm not sure where you got these two ways to make money in real estate from, but I would argue that they are very different and they require mm -hmm. completely different skill sets. So I wouldn't assume that you have to learn one or the other and then pick up the other. You may never need to. Uh, the Burr strategy is going to require either capital, like your capital or somebody else's capital, an understanding usually of how to rehab a property, an understanding of analysis, how like will it work once I'm done, and then relationships with different banks to try to go get financing as well as some property management skills. Wholesaling is completely different. That's going to require knowledge of how to build a funnel, how to connect with another human being, strong negotiation skills, strong persistence. Like You're going to be working really hard and making a ton of contacts. I can do the burst strategy and do none of the things I just described for wholesaling at all. In fact, mostly I wait for a deal to come into my email and I say, okay, I'll take that one. And everybody else does the work. I don't do any of it. So the question I would say, Jerome, is what are you better at? What do you think that you will do better at? Are you the gadfly that can just go from person to person and put things together and get everyone bringing their stuff to you when someone has a distressed property they need to sell? Or are you more the analytical type who likes to see how numbers work that can design you know, a big portfolio of properties? And I would figure out what you like and what you're better at and pursue that road. Yeah, pick a path that speaks to your greatness. I have a whole different... Um, perspective on this, and I agree with David as well. But you got to look at the, the result of a Burr strategy is rental properties that produce passive income for you. The result of a wholesale business is chunks of cash that are generated through a marketing company that you are driving, right? Um, and so there, the results are different, as David said. The skill set's very different in creating this type of thing. But at the end of the day, the result that you get is passive income or a business, and you gotta remember that that business, you gotta keep pumping in to feed it every time. Now I know very successful wholesalers, but they've built this machine that still spends off capital and you know chunks of cash, but it's not a passive investment. And it may spend off more money in the beginning. Yeah. The Burr strategy will be a longer marathon um, run, but I think that you're gonna be more successful if you can figure it out to, to pick between the two. If you want the passive income, I would go Burr and be willing to go long. Um, is what I would do because I would want the, I would want the passive income personally. Well, and one of the really cool things about the Burr strategy is it applies all the way up to scale. Yeah. You can do that with a hundred unit apartment complex or a two hundred unit apartment complex. Technically, you can wholesale those, but it gets a lot lot trickier. Uh, so the Burr strategy is something that once you get that down, you can apply it on a massive scale and really build wealth. You know, somebody else mentioned. Uh, let's jump ahead to that question. Can you burr a multifamily? I saw that question in the feed. Do you want to Ooh, answer that? Absolutely. So we have, we have several properties that we purchased and put um, maybe five, six, seven, eight thousand a unit into it. And then within two and a half years, refinanced. Now, so we bought them with a bridge loan and we, then we refinanced into agency debt. So that's Fannie, uh, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. And we were able to pull out everything that we put into it sent all that money back to us and the investors, and now we're playing with house money. So we no longer have any of the money that we put into those properties. And then when you look back at the cash flow over the last few years, in actuality, we've pulled out 200, almost 200% of what we put in. We still own it, and there's still a huge chunk of equity in it. So the Burr strategy, uh, with multifamily is is awesome. I mean, it's incredible. It's wealth building it's, it's uh, you're adding multiple zeros, and, and yep. the banks get it. I think a little better, honestly. The banks get the burst strategy for a multifamily. They're willing to play the game. They really don't question the cash out or anything like that. They're really just valuing the property on income. Yep. Um, it's the burst strategy is like on steroids for an apartment building. You know, the, the Burr book is really a business book more than just mm -hmm. a real estate book because mm -hmm. this strategy works for many different kinds of business. You can use this on a restaurant. You can go buy a restaurant that's not performing very well, rehab it, get it performing very well, make it more profitable, and then go get another loan to pay off maybe a higher rate debt that you took out to buy the property. Exact same principle. The idea of buying something that's not performing, that's undervalued, improving its performance, and then when it has a new value, 
refinancing it or taking money against it to go pay off either the investors or the higher rate debt or yourself if you put your money in wherever it goes is very simple in business. Now, this book describes how to do it within real estate, but like these guys said, it really works better in multifamily yeah. than in just single family. Because if I want to improve the value of a single family home, I have to look at the, the costs. I have to improve the, the appraised value of that property, which is usually from a rehab. When these guys want to improve the value of their home, they have to improve the NOI, right? Like it's it's easier for them to, to pull on to all these different levers, whereas I just have to like endure a rehab. There's almost no way around it most of the time. So I think it does work better for multifamily. You wanted to add something? Yeah, I want to add something really important if you're doing the Burr strategy with multifamily is the type of debt you put on there is critical to that strategy. When you're doing a single family house, you, whether you use private money, hard money, or a traditional bank loan, you can get out of that in six months. There's no prepayment. There's, you can do it as early or in most many cases as late as you want. Multifamily is completely different. If you're looking to refinance, you need to go with some form of bridge or bank debt because the agency debt like Fannie and Freddie or CMBS has massive prepayment penalties and they will absolutely kill the economics of your deal. So it's very important not to just buy right and operate right, but you gotta finance it right. So if you're going to Burr, the two things, the, the two ways to structure it is get, um, get bank or, or bridge debt and then refinance into Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, or you can go into it with a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan and then you can get what's called a supplemental. And that's the equivalent of getting a second mortgage on your house where you pull out some equity and hopefully go do another investment and not buy a car or Ferrari. <laughs> <coughs> In the multifamily world, it's called a supplemental. And you can do that as basically an equivalent of the Burr strategy. Um, just you have to know upfront what you're gonna do so you don't put yourself in a debt situation that prevents you from executing. Uh, David, you had one from uh, Dane. What was my biggest <clears throat> loss during your time working in real estate? How did you learn from it, and how do you apply those lessons to the to the work you do? Look now? at Dane getting real, man. Yeah. All right. I like this question. I'm afraid I don't have a great answer for you. I was actually a very like careful or conservative investor, so I never lost money on a deal. The closest thing I came to it was I bought too many properties at one time. I had seventy properties under contract. <laughs> Or sorry, sorry, that's wrong. Seven, seven <laughs> properties under contract. <laughs> that was about to be seriously seven, impressive. Seven. I don't even know what's like, oh oh my, you can hold back on where I came from, right? <laughs> and I didn't understand the way the contract worked in uh, the state I was buying it in Florida. So it, within California, you have a contingency that lets you back out of a deal. And until you waive that contingency, you can use it whenever you want. Well, in Florida, it actually expires after a certain period of time. So I put a house under contract. I didn't get around to doing the due diligence, getting an inspection done on it because I was busy with other things. And then the title company said, hey, you're supposed to close in a week. So I called the inspector. I had him go out. Really bad property. It had been raining. Uh, basically, the entire interior of the property had been completely soaked with rain and the framing of the house had dry rot. It was going to have to go all the way down to the studs and be rebuilt. So I backed out, but I wasn't able to get my deposit back. I had $5,000 deposit on that property that I lost because my contingency had expired. So that's really the only time I lost money in a deal, if you could call it a deal, because I didn't really close on it, so it wasn't a, a deal. The biggest mistake I made was not being more aggressive. I should have bought more properties. I should have learned faster. I played the game not to lose instead of playing the game to win. And if I had been more aggressive, I would have won. If you look at the guys that had the fastest lap times today when we went out there racing, they were the yeah. aggressive drivers. Yeah. Now, maybe they spun out more often or they, they ticked some people off, bumping into them a little bit, but they ended up in the winner's circle because they were more aggressive. And there's a way to do that without making everybody hate you. But it's very important that you understand that aggressiveness is actually, you know, like a skill that you can develop that will oftentimes lead to a quicker, shorter, sorry, shorter learning curve and quicker results. Yeah, got the next question. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm actually surfing for the next question. Um, I can hit this one. Go ahead. So, uh, Tao Fang, what's your advice to work with non-accredited investors slash private money in terms of protecting yourself and the investor, etc. Uh, very wise to be asking this question because many, many people out there today are not asking that question. And the SEC is not someone that you want looking into all of your doings. One complaint from an not investor. Your your door. Yeah, yeah, one complaint from an investor, and they will send you a letter demanding documentation for every single deal you've done for the last 10 years. You don't want to have to go down that route. So the best way to work with non-accredited investors, number one, if you're gonna syndicate something, get a good syndication attorney. That is not an area where you wanna to try to save money. 
Definitely do not do it by yourself. Definitely do not get somebody else's and just try to copy it. Hire a good syndication attorney and follow their advice. The second big, second thing with the SEC, if you're going to do um, uh, sophisticated investors, no advertising. You cannot advertise in any form or fashion. That means you can't be on a webinar and say, yeah, I get my investors 8%. That's advertising. Because mm -hmm. in the SEC's eyes, the only reason you would say that is to attract an investor. So anything that you, th basically anything that you want to say to attract an investor, you probably shouldn't say it. <laughs> the other thing is, and the other main qualification is you have to make sure that you can demonstrate a pre-existing relationship with that person. And what that means is you had a substantive relationship with that person before you started to offer your deal. And really the safest is before you had it under contract. How, do you, how does the SEC define substantive? The way that you can satisfy that requirement, 80%, is number one, when they say, when you meet them and they're interested, have a little one page questionnaire that they fill out and it says, you know, how you met, how they heard about you, um, are they accredited, or in your case, are they sophisticated? If they are sophisticated, why do they think they're sophisticated? Why are they interested in investing in your syndications? Why is that good for them financially and for their goals? So you have that form. The next thing, uh, is to have a short conversation with them. Now, if you're meeting them in person, that's satisfied. That's great. All you need to do is make some notes, attach those notes to their to their file in your in your CRM or your Excel if you're just getting started out. However, you're tracking that. So if anybody comes and says, "Well, hey, when did you meet this guy?" You say, "Well, look, I met him at a RIA meeting on March 4th. Uh, we talked for 15 minutes. He explained to me that he's just got this money sitting in his IRA. It's not doing anything. He doesn't need it for any other purpose." He really wants to get into real estate, and then he filled out this form, and he told me, that, um, you know, answered all these questions, and we've known each other for this many months, and this is a good fit for him. That would satisfy the requirement, and you should be good to go. That's awesome. I can't add anything more to that because that was brilliant what you just said. Um, all else I'll say is there's a lot on the SEC in my book Raising Private Capital, and if you buy my book Raising Private Capital on the Bigger Pocket Store, you get you can get an hour and a half interview with mine and Andrew's attorney Gene Trowbridge. I interviewed him for an hour and a half as a bonus gift from Bigger Pockets. Um, we get into a lot of what Andrew just talked about from one of the most brilliant minds in the SEC world, Gene Trowbridge. And he takes a dry topic and makes it kind of entertaining. It was really it was yeah. Bad. Gene, Gene's a yeah. fun guy to talk to. He's an interesting dude. So uh, go to Bigger Pocket Store, use the coupon code book birthday to buy the book today for 20% off raising private capital and you get a bunch of freebie stuff including an hour and a half interview with Gene Trowbridge um, I have an update a very important update to give you guys uh, David asked earlier if you guys could all comment which Avenger <laughs> you thought that uh, that the three of us would represent or embody um, Andrew's coming in as uh, Dylan has his update here Matt is Captain America because I'm wearing the shirt um, Andrew is Ant-Man. Somehow or another, you're Ant-Man. <laughs> it's that dry sense of humor, I guess, you got over right there. Paul right, Rudd, right, right, Paul Rudd, scientist kind of dude. Um, and they're calling uh, uh, David as Iron Man, uh, which I see. I actually, I do pegged at the Hulk. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah he's kind of right. got that gentle giant thing going on. He's very kind. And just, I feel like if I piss him off enough, his clothes might rip yeah. off and he turns I green. I have a very angry side. And then right. That window. I, I think that, yeah, right, right. Maybe he was. Yeah. Yeah. I thought for sure Andrew was going to be Hawkeye. Me too. Right? I thought that too. Yeah, like, that, yeah. I always call this guy the sniper. When he gets a deal in his sights, it is going down one shot, yeah. one kill, done. Yeah. Right? So yeah. if you guys get to know Andrew, you'll know he is Hawkeye. Yeah, he's Hawkeye. I like yes. Hawkeye. I'll take that. Right. Or you could be Groot because you're kind of tall. That's good. <laughs> right. You know, well, I, have a, I, have, I have a bigger vocabulary. Though. You do. You say a lot more than I am Groot. I get it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Next question. Jordan Lindsay says, hey, David, what do you think about becoming a signing agent through the notary in Denver, Colorado to make extra income? So I would say, Jordan, it's not going to be a ton of money. It's going to be very time intensive. It's definitely not passive income. The only time I'd recommend somebody to do that is if it's a stepping stone to a bigger goal. So if you know that you need to make extra income so that you can put less time into maybe your sales job and more into learning real estate, do it. If you're looking at this as a long-term plan for how you're going to build wealth, not a very good vehicle. I wouldn't recommend that. And, and then the other question Jonathan said was, how can Burr go wrong? Yeah, so I find Burr goes point. wrong in two main ways. You get these two right, you're probably not going to lose money. The first is going to be the rehab. Like any type of construction thing, there's less control you have over it. It's very easy for rehab budgets to go over time and over budget as far as money goes. Yeah, so okay. if you get your rehab part down, that's, that's a big hurdle that you've overcame. The All second right. is going to be the refinance. 
Because like someone mentioned earlier, you don't get to control what the appraiser says. Like Both of the aspects of bird that go wrong are the parts you can't control. You're not doing the work on the rehab. You're not coming up with the value at the end that the appraiser is coming up with. Now you can limit how often those go wrong by learning how construction works and how con construction crews operate and by learning how appraisers think. And that's why that's the advice I give you. Learn to see it from the perspective of an appraiser. Learn how construction companies make money and limit the amount of damage that they can do mm -hmm. within your deal while, while capitalizing on the value they can bring. I, I use my construction guys for more than just a bid and building. I ask them, where can we add square footage for the cheapest? What do you think we should do to design it? Where can you add the most value that maybe I don't know about? And they often have really good ideas. So that's, those are the two ways that Burke can go wrong that I would recommend. Brilliant. Um, and, and, I'm, and I think this is the absolute authority on Burr, um, wrote the book on Burr also. Yep. Um, so somebody on, on Facebook made a brilliant comment about the Avengers uh, thing, further update, is that David has to be the Hulk because his last name yes. is Green. You're Green. <gasps> right. really He's point. Green. He already is Green, right? So, okay. Um, what do you, yeah, yeah, quick, Facebook quick one. Jimmy, Jimmy Thorpe. Why do most investors buy a rehab property rather than build, right? As a builder, I can, I can build a new product with much more equity. I understand turnaround time, et cetera. I see there's a couple of reasons. Number one, most new investors don't know how to go out and build. That's a, right. that, that, that's they're a, not Jimmy. Yeah, they're, right. because they're not Jimmy. So actually, <laughs> not so, you. so kudos, kudos to you for being able to do yeah. that. I'm actually just moving into some development myself. So that, that's one reason. Um, but that, but it brings up a good point of, of kind of looking at where you are in the market, right? If you can buy a, uh, a C-class property for 100 a unit and then you got to put 10 into it to get it cleaned up, now you're into it for 110 a unit and you can go out and buy, build something for brand new for 120 or 130 a unit, which you can in, in some of the markets that I'm in, then it might actually make sense to go ahead and start doing development instead of just purchasing um, something that's there. So. That could, you know, that's something to do if you're concerned about overpaying for maybe you know lower end properties, especially if you're like, you know, what? I like development. I, I like, I'm not, I haven't done anything, but I like that idea. Go partner with someone who's in development and get into that game. So. And to bottom line this um, is that if find a, find a competitive advantage or an unfair advantage that you bring to the table, Jimmy. And the fact of the matter is, if you can build, there's a lot of people that tell me they don't build is because the cost isn't there and they're worried about keeping costs down. And they're worried about you know something that's the opposite of what you said that when you build you can create lots of equity because yeah. you build quality product at a low cost. That's an advantage you have. So you got to play advantages you have that you can bring it to your real estate business. So I would say you should do it. And the fact that other people aren't doing it, it's just a simple fatter fact of the matter is they're not you. They don't have the resources that you have. Yeah, well said. Yeah. So you had you had a one that showed up here off of a YouTube. Yeah, Matt. I think you should answer this Go ahead. one. Uh, to be real. What are some things you should screen for when looking for a potential partner? Sure. Um, and this is a potential partner for anything. I think that you've got to first and foremost check that. And this, this even plays into life partner, like choosing a, choosing a spouse or anything like that. You've got to make sure that their goals are in line with yours. This mm -hmm. is the marriage thing as well as um, a business partner, of course. Make sure that the goal, their goals align with yours, like what they want out of life, what they want out of the business. Um, make sure their scruples align with yours. Like there, there was somebody who I was thinking about doing business with, and he alluded that um, with the, he was telling me he was telling me a story of an insurance claim he had at a property, and he pretty much alluded that he had committed insurance fraud. You know, that he said like, well, I told the bank that, you know, the roof was bad too, and it really wasn't that bad, but I told the bank that, I told the insurance company that I was able to get, I was able to get the insurance company to give me money to fix a roof that he didn't fix, no. you know, but he got that money, pretty much insurance fraud, straight up. I decided not to do business with that person because I know that in that, in that moment, went, why, Jack, insurance company? I can't imagine. Yeah, because at the end of the day, in that moment, it was the insurance company, but I think in another moment, it could be me. You know, or it could be, you know, and I, and I get the insurance. Sometimes you can win off on an insurance claim, but um, that didn't, it just didn't rub me the right way. And so I would make sure that you ask a lot of questions, make sure there's a lot, of, a lot of goal alignment, and also bottom line, understand when you do business with somebody, unless it's on like a quickie fix and flip or something like that, it's probably going to be a long term get into bed um, arrangement. And I have had uh, bad part partnerships go bad that take a while, they're, they're a pain to unwind. And so you'd be very careful. Um, when you get into a partnership. And as they say, uh, hire slowly, fire quickly, but when you, it's very hard to fire a partner. So slowly engage in that partnership and make sure that there's a lot of alignment before you get in. And 
above all that, make sure that everything's documented in the operating agreement that you formed each other and never do a handshake partnership. Just document all of it. Mario has a quick follow-up question on the uh, building and development thing. He says, do banks finance builds? Yes, they do. Uh, it's just got to be the right kind of bank. It's got to be a, a fit for it. Typically, you might get like 65% and there's going to be construction draws, meaning as you make progress, you say, okay, we need 100 grand. They approve everything. They send you the 100 grand, and that's generally how it goes. Uh, I'm not an expert in development, but again, I have started that process, and uh, it looks like I'm going to be working with a regional bank that um, I've done some other loans with, and they're like, yeah, we'll finance your construction project. So yes, uh, banks are one avenue for doing that. Cool. All right. Um, Aramas asked, Hey, I wanted to, I, I wanted to ask how to become a real estate investor using other people's money. Um, what would you do in that case? Thank you. Okay. Well, that's that's I, uh, my book, Raising Private Capital, is about how to do that, um, and you can do it on uh, my book. Talks about how to do it on small deals, big deals, and everything in between. Uh, it does not have to be multi million dollar apartment buildings, as Andrew and I are both doing. Um, in that, you can also do uh, private money on small deals. Um, how do you do it? Well, I think that the first move is probably not to go and buy your first piece of real estate with somebody else's money. So you should build a track record of, of, of real estate deals that you can take to your investor base and say, hey, look what I've done. Um, because it just brings that much street cred to it. So if you have your own money, then do deals with your own money. If you don't, then either mentor underneath someone else so you can build a track record and build some education for yourself um, through someone else's business. So either as an intern or as an assistant or helping somebody along get their business going. And you can meet them off of biggerpockets.com in your local po in your local area. Look on BP and find someone who's operating in your backyard and work with them. Find a local flipper and say, you know, hey, can I run around and take pictures of your deals and make Home Depot runs for your guys and you know be a gopher on your deal so I can get some industry experience and then can I can also claim your deal as something that I was a part of um, to my investor base. They likely will let you do it because they need help. Um, that's one way to do it. Or the other way to do it would be if, if, if you don't have your own money, find a way to um, leverage things like hard money. I know people might get a little squirrely about this, but using short-term credit cards to take out small chunks of money off of a short-term credit card to do a deal. A credit card is a little mini hand grenade that's gonna go off in your hand eventually, so <laughs> it's like somebody handed you a live grenade, so you better get rid of it quick uh, when, you use a, when you use a credit card loan, but it is a way to get started. I've done it when I first got started, so it's possible for you too uh, if you don't have your own money, but I highly recommend doing deals at first to develop a track record, then reaching out to your network to find people with money that wanna work with you based on the track record that you built. So, well, sure, cool. another question? I like that. JP said, David, how do you keep a straight face when Brandon says rough instead of roof? <laughs> With a lot of mental focus, my friend. Right. Brandon says weird things all the time. He says bag instead of bag, dragon instead of dragon. Like, right. This comes up often. Uh, the rough, rough instead of roof things. He's from Minnesota and then the Pacific Northwest oh, where they, no. they say things funny. Um, so yeah, I, 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 but honestly, Brandon's so much fun that you, you just turn it into a joke. Like everything with that guy is a joke. When you're with Brandon, minutes fill. But he'll let like you minutes. joke with him about that, right? Like yeah, he's not going to get his back up if you tease him about the rough, calling it a rough. You like, what do you mean, like a dog says rough, Brandon? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Like, with the roof on the roof on the top of that. In fact, you could probably right. ask him about that and he would talk to you about it. Brandon just has one of like the smallest egos I've ever met in a human being. Super big heart, super kind guy. Yeah. And very fun. Like, <laughs> even with the way he talks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What do you got? All right, Jerry wants to know, is finding great multifamily deals any different than single family deals? Mm, what do you think about that? Ooh, just maybe, yeah. A little bit, uh, just a little, a little bit. bit, yeah. You know yeah. what, it's a graduating scale. It really depends on the size. So in single family, you might do SEO, you might do direct mail, you might do bandit signs, you'll work with realtors. I mean, there's, there's, there's a ton of ways to go find those deals. As you move into smaller multifamily, so 5, 10, 20, 30 units, most of those are also owned by, you know, we say mom and pop, but, you know, a couple of investors, a dentist, um, you know, just, just kind of, you know, smaller people that may not be super sophisticated. Uh, and, you know, those can be reached by calling them or sending, sending letters. I wouldn't send yellow letters. I would send something a little more sophisticated or personal. Uh, and you can find them that way. As you move up bigger and bigger, it turns more into the brokers control the relationships. Uh, once you start looking at stuff that's over 50 units, most of those are um, the true owners are hidden within an LLC. And brokers, you know, all the big ones you've heard of, Cushman and Wakefield, Marcus and Millichap, Percadia, CBRE, 
They spend their lives building relationships with the owners of these properties. And the bigger you are looking in multifamily, the more efficient it is to build a relationship with those brokers who've already built the relationships with all the owners so that you can leverage the work that they've done to bring you deals. That's not the only way, but at the, the further up the chain you go, that is the most effective and efficient way. That's brilliant, that's brilliant. And so in Cushman and Wakefield, this Andrew Cushman unfortunately does not own that company. Don't get those two Not companies. yet, not yeah, yet. He, he will, Gary Vaynerchuk will buy the New York Jets. Uh, Andrew Cushman will eventually go well, and just I buy wanna, out the Wakefield family. And I want to yeah, I want to walk into the Atlanta office and be like, "I'm Mr. Cushman. Things yeah. are going to change your right. Guys, right. my yeah, right. Just so you know, just, you see my driver's license, yeah, you can yeah. see yeah, automatic race. So, guys, you've got a question here off of YouTube. Yes, uh, how do you find out what a property will refinance for by Chris Allen? That's a big part of Burr. So you always want to start with the end in mind. So I always tell people mm -hmm. start with what it's going to refi for. Then go to a bank and say, hey, can I get pre-approved for a loan? Don't go do all the work of a deal and then try to find your lender and just hope that you can find someone to pre-approve you. And they say, oh, you won't be eligible for another six months because of your job. Well, you could have just waited six months and learned more about real estate rather than getting involved. So what you want to do is you want to A, ask an agent who understands the market for your preliminary screening. Hey, someone who's a top producer in the office, give me an idea of what you think it would appraise for a range. Then the other thing that I do is I actually pay an appraiser for their time to look at the deal. So before I buy anything, and, and honestly for my clients when I'm listing their house for sale, I look at the comps and I talk to other agents, but then I go to the appraiser and I say, what do you think this thing would appraise for? Because if I can sell it for 600, but it's only gonna appraise for 570, that doesn't really help us. So I like to go to people who are better at what they do than I am and get them involved in it just to make sure that I'm looking at it from the right perspective or maybe they saw something that I missed. That I missed. Now, the cheapest way is you go pull up comps for yourself. You either ask an agent to send them to you or you go find them on Zillow or something. The problem is you don't know what you're missing. Like the, the, the question we got earlier where the person said, hey, I got tw six good comps and the appraiser didn't look at it. Well, you missed the other 12 that maybe he was looking at. That's why I don't like to buy them myself. I like to use, you know, a realtor has access to the MLS or an appraiser. But that's what you do. It's gonna cost you a little bit of money. That's why For a couple hundred bucks money, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's worth a peace of mind, isn't it? A hundred percent, and yeah. it's and it's worth yeah. the twenty thousand dollar low appraisal you might have got, or something like that. It's it's a cost of doing business, and that's okay because if you stay and you're committed to this, eventually you're going to buy the deal, and it's going to be so good you're not going to care about that couple hundred bucks that you spent. Right, it's, you know? it's worth that peace of mind. Um, you got a uh, we've got another uh, YouTube question here, but that's another good David one. But you got anything else over here on Facebook? Yeah, listen, my feed keeps freezing. I'm going to get a bag. So you want to go ahead and take one Yeah, from sure, there. sure. I, I thought this uh, would be a good one here from Jose. Is financing the whole bird process a good method to start investing in real estate? A local bank is offering a loan based on the re on the after rehab value. That's a screaming good deal if you get yeah. a bank that's going to do yeah. something like that. I don't see a lot of those right now. So yeah. I would learn what their terms are. The, the first question I'd ask the bank is, are you giving me 75% loan to value? Because if the bank says, we'll give you a, a loan based on the after rehab value, but they're giving you 60% of it, you got to get a really good deal to get your capital back out of that thing. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the first question is like, what loan of value am I actually working with here? And then find out what is that bank going to need to give you the loan? What are all the parameters that have to be met? And set your business plan up to make sure that all those things got met. Is there a seasoning period before they'll let you refinance out of that loan if they're giving you the money up front? Are they going to need you to show them what the contractor is going to be doing and they have to approve it? And if so, what is that process going to look like? You don't want to just jump into this and assume, oh, it's going to be great. Have them spell out for you what you're going to do. Make sure it looks good. And then set your plan up according to their parameters. Cool. Um, go ahead. Yeah, so Daniel Merced has a, a question that kind of gets back to the how can, how can a burst strategy go wrong, right? He says, hey guys, thanks for all the free knowledge. I'm looking into getting some funds for a first investment from someone in my funnel. Got 100,000, wants to do burr. I'm thinking of offering 8%. What if the house doesn't get the ARV that I budget for? What do I do about paying them back at that point? Well, David just addressed a lot of things you can do to make sure you don't get in that situation. Yep. I love the idea of paying an appraiser up front. Like if you're concerned, especially if you're new at this and you're concerned about, geez, I gotta get the ARV right, pay an appraiser. That, mm -hmm. That's a brilliant strategy. I mean, that, I, I've actually never heard anyone say that. And I think that that that's brilliant. You're just hiring the expert. That that that's the guy who's going to value it when the bank bank orders the refinance anyway. So, 
But let's say let's say it doesn't quite appraise. How do you pay that back? Well, the first question is, do you have any other resources? Um, do you, you know? Do you, do you have savings? Do you have another property? Um, you know, is there any other way that, that you can pay it back? It also depends on your relationship with the guy. If it's somebody you know pretty well, maybe you can just um, you know extend the loan. Or if you borrowed hundred k, let's say you do a burr and you can pay him back eighty thousand. Well, does he really need that twenty thousand back? Can you restructure it and say, hey, for this twenty thousand, can we amortize this over three years and I'm going to pay this off with cash flow from the house? That's a, that's a, that's a way to do it. Um, you could just say, hey, you know what? The bird the bird didn't quite work out like we hoped. Let's sell it. Let's take a good profit and go do it again. So there's even if it doesn't work, as long as you bought it basically right, there's still a handful of other exit strategies. And you guys may think of a few more, but sure. that's what comes well, to mind. I think that I try and approach deals and think and put investors first. Yeah. And so um, if you're if you do a deal and it ends up not appraising, then you might just look yourself in the mirror and decide if you did a risky deal that didn't put your investor first just to get into a deal. And if that's not the case, and if you just kind of stepped in a little bit of mud, or if David said construction cost overruns or whatever, things happen. Um, there's ways out that maybe you can offer the investor equity. Uh, maybe you can pay them over time, give them collateral on something else. But you got to make you got to think about these worst case scenarios when you get into real estate to have um, some coffers somewhere. I think that if you're getting into this business without any dollar at all for just in case money, then you might want to go and set aside a few dollars for just in case money in this business because things don't always work out exactly what you think they're going to. You might have to tap into that war chest to move things along. What are your thoughts on that? If you're getting into a deal and your only successful exit is you re refi 100% of the capital and pay everybody back on the first shot, you are giving yourself a tiny, tiny margin of error. Yep. And unless you're Hawkeye over here, you're probably not going to hit it. <laughs> he can't, right. he will. So yeah. I, like Matt said, I have tiers of how I expect the deal to go. Best case scenario, I rehab 100% of the capital and I'm out. What about likely scenario? Well, it could be where I leave 10% of our money in this deal, and I like to look at what would my ROI be if I left 10% in. It's usually really good, like 50% or better. And then worst case scenario, if I can't pay everybody back and, and I don't have enough money, then I'm not doing the deal. What that means is I need to go become a mobile notary and drive around signing paper like the person asked to save up enough money so that I have a cushion. So in the worst case scenario, I don't die. I live to fight another day and I hope I do better. Yep. Right? That's actually the reason why I, I tell people you should work really hard and save money. You're not going to become super wealthy saving money, but it will give you the cushion that you need to take the chances and the risk that will make you wealthy. So that's the way that I look at it. Don't expect it to go perfect right off the bat. And if there's any contingency or you have no contingencies and anything goes wrong, it's a failure and you're stuck, you're not ready to invest. Yeah. I had a question coming from, did you want to uh, build on that or did you have No, question? I was going to go another one, so go ahead. Yeah, I got one. Um, from Cooling Station, I love people's names on YouTube. They can they just make up they their own name. So Cooling Station um, jumps in with uh, with a great question about investing through pre-construction condos. And in, I know nothing about the Toronto market, so my friend Cooling Station, I'm not going to comment about Toronto. But I've been around long enough to remember, and I know you have too, you probably have too, when people were investing in pre-construction condos for the purpose of appreciation and trying to flip contracts. It's common in Miami. When you hear that word, do you think like timeshare? Yeah. Like that whole, like... Why? Well, I, I remember condo I think flipping, contract greater, flipping. Yeah, greater fool theory. Yeah, right. I mean, it kind of made my skin crawl a little bit when I saw that. But I want to. But and I'm not going to start criticizing the concept because it it really gets to the why. Okay, if you're doing it, hoping on appreciation, like putting a property, and what happened in the market run up was people were putting a condo in Miami under contract that was going to sell for two hundred and fifty thousand bucks. They were going to post a five thousand dollar deposit, put it under contract, and then six months later, three months later, whatever, flip that contract and try and make 50 grand, okay? And they were doing it, and they were making money flipping contracts, it was insane, it wasn't right, it was happening, it was still happening though. So, cooling station, if you're going to do this, and I get we've, we're in a, we've had a really good run right now in, in real estate, so if you're going to do this, hoping to flip that pre-construction contract to someone else and play hot potato or play musical chairs of, of real estate and have someone else uh, you know, jump in that chair of that contract before the property is ready for occupancy. <clears throat> you shouldn't do that at any time in the market because it's gambling. Um, yeah. But you definitely shouldn't do it now because we've had a really good run and a lot of folks are saying that we might even be, we might be facing at least 
a slowdown or if not a full a full pullback in in, uh, in real estate. And we can talk about what our opinions of that are, but either way, that is a huge gamble. Don't take it. But if you're going to be doing this uh, based on the cash flow, if the numbers work for what the rents are and what cash flow is on the property as a rental deal on the on the property, then sure, do That's it. That's what and I was going to say. Yeah. 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 yeah, you have a backup plan. You got to have another exit. If it did it go yeah. perfectly, you could still rent it out and you could wait till the market goes back to the Go to Airbnb. Yeah. Right. If you're doing it to flip the paper, no, get out of that. Don't do that. If you're doing it as a rental deal, and maybe, and if the market continues to go up and run, you can flip the paper and make some and make a chunk of cash. But go in with the purpose of owning that property longer term. And if you're getting it for a great deal because it's pre-construction, then go for it. That's what you sense. We got. Um, so uh, Shiva says, uh, when you find a house, do you want to flip? Do you have to fight off other inve- uh, other investors? Yeah, that's why we're the Avengers. You got to yeah. fight off other that's people it. on everything yeah. right now. They're all Thanos. So, they're all evil. All the other investors that we fight off. Yeah, you know, and, and that Hawkeye over here puts an arrow in their heart. Right. That's why. <laughs> and, and that applies to everything, though. Not just a single family. That's that small multifamily right. Right now that big multifamily right now it's very very rare that you're not uh, at least trying to outmaneuver or, or win a bid against other investors now there are some situations if you're really good with reaching out to people and making connections where you can be the only person uh, but in many cases uh, especially with single family but in many cases you are fighting off other investors you may not even know about them right the seller could have called three or four other people and then and you know again especially in multifamily uh, you're typically uh, even on off market stuff there's typically at least a handful of other people that you're competing against it's just part of the market and you have to find out what your edge is and what you can do to make your offer and who you are the most attractive to the seller and that is not always the highest price mm-hmm. You also need to understand that speed matters yep. in this world. Yep. That if you're the person who likes to really slow down and think about things on and look at it from every angle because you want to be extra careful, that can actually hurt you in the sense that a guy like me is going to come in and have already done all that work and put it in the contract before you get a chance to. Yep. So it, you should be careful. You shouldn't be reckless and just write offers, but don't wait until you've got the deal in front of you to try to learn what you should be looking for. Understand your screening criteria way before you get in that position so that when the opportunity is there, boom, it's time to go. I always tell people the time to load your gun is not when you're in the gunfight. You you should have already yeah. been prepared because those seconds can really matter. I love yeah. both your analogies, and, man. You guys, you guys have the best ones. Well, and part of loading the gun is knowing your market, right? It gets frustrating these days to have to look at a thousand deals and not buy one. But what you're doing is looking at those thousand bad deals. Is the You look at a thousand bad deals, the minute a good one comes along, you're going to spot it like that. Yeah. Right, and you can jump on it, and you're gonna know, and you're gonna be able to do it with confidence. You're gonna be able to offer aggressive terms, and, and you're gonna be able to get that deal. Absolutely, that's great. So uh, we're gonna do one more question, uh, and then I'm gonna wrap it up. Um, and that, so just stick around for the wrap up because we have an exciting announcement for you guys for tonight um, that I want to tell you guys about. So stick around. But go ahead with uh, Jar Smith had a great question. I'll I'll prime it up for you. What are some potential good locations for rental buying opportunities? And I know in your book, um, Long Distance Real Estate Investing, I think, is it the title? Yeah, that's okay. it. Um, that you, I'm sure you talk about locations and stuff like that. So how does, yeah, you don't have to start naming cities, but when you think about location selection, what are some criteria that people should consider? Let's look, let's look at it that way. So first off, you guys have heard me say a lot, rock stars, no rock stars, and I'm a very big proponent of this band that the elite level people tend to hang out together. And I'm actually sitting here with some of the rock stars that I, <laughs> that I collaborate with on this exact question. Where are we buying? What are you seeing? Where do you want to be? Okay, and I look at what their screening criteria is. I tell them what mine are. We look at how we can improve each other's processes. This is a, a regular conversation that I have with the people in this room. When you're looking to buy rental properties, I'm assuming you're talking about single family residential properties that you want in cash flow. When you are in a down market, you can buy in coastal markets, which tend to see big run-ups in appreciation and big crashes in a down market. You get these really big undulations, which really result in big opportunity to build wealth. If you look at like the Japanese economy, it's just been the same all the time. It's very hard to build wealth in an economy like that. You need like fluctuations. That's where opportunity provides itself. We right now are in like an up period, right? It's, it's more likely to go down than it is to keep going up a lot. So what happens is I move slower into the country as the property stop cash flowing. When you get to the middle of the country, you're starting to get this like flat line, just not really changing a whole like Indiana doesn't go up a lot, doesn't go down a lot. It's kind of the same. So in high markets, I buy in the Midwest, maybe in the South. 
in low markets, I buy in more aggressive market or in low economies, I buy in more aggressive markets like California, Oregon, Seattle, um, on the East Coast, maybe like that's when you can actually buy properties in New York or Boston, mm-hmm. which is very difficult to do right now. Miami, okay. As the economy gets better and prices go up, you got to start moving in. So I'm in California. I was buying in California first. When California's too expensive, I go over one state, right? I'm looking in like like Nevada, in Arizona, and then you're going to go in another state from there, and you slowly start more or less moving closer to the middle of the country. And then when the economy actually dips again, I'm going to run right back to the perimeter, and that's where I'm going to be buying when prices are low and waiting for them to go up. And the next level of that strategy would be buying low, letting the prices come up on the coast, refinancing and taking your money out and sticking that in the middle of the country so that you get both the mm-hmm. best of worlds burying so you That's keep brilliant. that capital and you have it when the markets go back down so you can go back and buy the next elevator right up yep. Yep. guys that's brilliant I mean if those of you guys are watching the recording of this rewind this and listen to that again because that was absolute gold for how to play uh, high markets, short markets, and really how to, how to run the marathon of real estate. Yeah. This really is a marathon. And if you want to be in this business long-term and make a career and build long-term wealth in this business, you're going to see ups and downs in this market. I've seen yeah. two of them since I started, and that's brilliant. And what he described is absolute. That's absolutely uh, what I've seen happen as well. Do you think you want to come well, to say, yeah, market selection? If you look at the most successful career real estate people, they don't say, oh, we're near the top, we're going to sit out and not do anything. They yeah. adjust their strategy, they yeah. adjust their they location, keep they keep, play, they find the right way to play for the market they're in, and that, 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 that's a big part of what mm-hmm. David very elegantly, elegantly laid out. So. Yeah, good thing you wrote a book on that. Yeah, yeah. cool. Thank you. Um, so here's what, this has like been the fastest hour I've ever been a part of. This has been awesome. Um, but I want to let you guys know that tonight I am teaching a webinar. You guys all need to go to tonight to biggerpockets.com forward slash webinars and register for my webinar, which is called Hannah Analyze a Deal in 20 Minutes or Less. If you want to be successful in real estate, you need to look at a lot of deals. David mentioned this. Uh, Andrew mentioned this as well, so that you don't walk in with your, you know, loading your gun into the gunfight. You know what exactly it is you're looking at, and you'll be able to recognize a better deal the more deals you analyze. So I want to teach you guys and they give you guys the tools that you need, how to analyze deals quickly, and we're going to go through an actual real live deal on the live webinar. This is tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern. I'm in Texas, so that's 7 p.m. Uh, Texas time, Central time, and then on down from there, you know, six and five o'clock if you're in California. But that'll be tonight. Go on biggerpockets.com forward slash webinars. This is a free webinar. This is a great thing that Bigger Pockets does to provide lots of free education for you guys to come check out. Uh, and even if you can't be on the webinar, go and register for it because you'll still get an email recording of the webinar that you can watch between now and Wednesday at midnight. So go to biggerpockets.com forward slash webinars right now, register for it, and I'll see you guys tonight. Uh, final words, Andrew. How do people get a hold of you? They want to hear more about all the cool stuff that you're doing. I'm on Van- I'm on uh, on Bigger Pockets, of course. And um, when I'm not making Avenger movies, you can find me <laughs> at uh, just Van- just just go Vantage Point Acquisitions. Uh, it's a really bad abbreviation website. www.vpacq.com is a contact us on there that comes right to my email inbox, and uh, I'll respond as quickly as I can. Cool. This guy. Cool. And aside from listening to your lovely voice in the Bigger Pockets podcast every week. And it is uh, lovely. It I is. It's a great interview. Soothing, yeah. It really is. Yeah, yeah. It's the most uncop voice out there. It's very soothing and peaceful and stuff. Yeah. Well, I can turn it yeah. up if I have. <laughs> 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 I like to keep, like, right. you know, when Hulk goes crazy. Let me see your hands. His right. clothes yeah. come off. He gets naked. It gets rough, right? Yeah, right. Like, Don't do yeah. that. I'm scared right. everybody. Well, when you're not smashing cars and jumping out windows and stuff like that and turning green, how do people, uh, uh, and you already are green, how do people uh, get a hold of you? So I have a, a blog you can follow. Follow the deals that I do and the stuff I write at greenincome.com. But the best way to get a hold of me is to follow me on Instagram at davidgreen24 and ask the questions through the direct messaging system that you weren't able to get right here. I can't get to all of them, but I try to get through as many of them as I can. Andrew was just calling me, what was it, like Thunder Thumbs or something? Yeah, I, th- thumbs of Thunder. Thumbs of Thunder, thumbs yeah. of this guy, thunder. This guy can move his, th- move his thumbs faster than anybody I've ever seen. I mean, they're a blur. So I don't know what Avenger that would be, but... <laughs> That's because I'm trying to get through all your Instagram questions. I've had to adapt to be able to move at that speed, right? Like you got to be that Ferrari. So message me on Instagram. Tell me what questions you are. Tell me what your real estate related goals are. I'd love to figure out some way I can help you, whether it's buying a house, helping you get a mortgage, connecting you with an agent, answering a question, whatever the case is. We love real estate investing. We love helping people build wealth. We want to combine them together. So that's your best shot to get a hold of me. And you can get a hold of me at derosagroup.com to hear more about what my company's up to. And of course, uh, connect with me on Bigger Pockets and see me on tonight's webinar.
rbiggerpockets.com forward slash webinars. And if you feel so inclined, pick up a copy of my book for the birthday of my book at biggerpockets.com forward slash store. You can also check out the two books that David Green wrote. Um, the Burr, you know, just Burr, right? It's by Rehab Rate Price Repeat. But if you right. type in Burr book, you'll find Burr it. Burr book. And then the other book, uh, Long Distance Real Estate. Long Distance Real Estate Investing. Two phenomenal books. And I've actually heard that the Burr book is, uh, is, doing, is doing really well right now yeah. on sales. So see what the buzz is all about. Check out the Burr book and check out my book, Raising Private Capital for the Book Birthday by using the coupon code book birthday to get 20% off the book. You just got to use that today. Man, I'm getting book envy over here. You should, well, you should read yeah, a book. I, I, you should. I, I, Dude, it's actually pretty cool. There, it's yeah. fun to write a book. Cool. Gentlemen, thank you. Good time. Good being with you. Good being with you. Thank you for watching, guys. As always, we appreciate you. And as I say on my YouTube channel, have a great and profitable week.